So it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Sally Redman. And you can read about some of the things she's done in the brochure. But I will apologise on her behalf if you have difficulty understanding her because she is New Zealand born. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. And, and there is obviously a little bit of a New Zealand push here, so apologies. Um, and also, um, Steve, thanks for really um, acknowledging the challenge of um, this uh, uh, section of the agenda. It's uh, challenging, I think, in two ways. One is, is that we've just seen, heard, I think, a series of some of the most um, fantastic talks that I remember hearing for a long time. So um, I, I think it's a very hard act to follow. And second, obviously, that at the task um, now is really to talk a little bit about solutions. And uh, as you said, Stephen, there's 15 minutes. And uh, you know, I think um, to some Summarise the things that I wanted to talk about. I guess I'm going to take a much more uh, grassroots kind of approach than what we've spoken about so far. And I think that um, I think um, I certainly know miracle answers here. Okay, so um, am I doing something wrong? Oh, okay, great. Okay, so. Um, um, I've been asked to talk about research and translate, uh, sorry, policy and translation, and I want just to start by acknowledging that we've got you know a long track of translation, and I think you know the speech that Ian gave just earlier is a good illustration of the way that that happens from bench top through to uh, clinical through clinical practice and into policy. I'd like to say that while translation is important and in fact policy is important across all of that continuum, I'm really going to focus today on talking about policy and what we can do to try and move policy, um, particularly in the space of health and inequity. Um, and particularly I'm going to talk about, I guess, the bureaucratic end of policy, not so much about how we influence politicians, but more how do we influence public servants and bureaucrats. Oops. So, okay, so... Um, I think we've already heard how important policy is in addressing the issue of health and inequity. And I'll just show this quote really from the World Health Organization which emphasizes some of the things that earlier speakers have mentioned, in particular the need for empowerment, the need for systemic change, law reform and economic reform, social reform. So, you know, in addressing the gap in health and inequality, policy is a really critical part of the equation. And, uh, and it's big picture changes that we're after here. So I think probably everybody in this room would acknowledge that when we're talking about policy change, research is only one component of that. The, you know, we really appoint politicians in order to deal with this messy space where there's lots of competing viewpoints and uh, we need to acknowledge that, I think, in terms of the way that we think about addressing policy in this space. No, I know you can't see this slide, and that's kind of the point. So <laughs> now I'm indebted to my colleague Sharon Frill for this, and uh, this is an attempt to model the forces around uh, uh, food policy and equity. And you can see, first of all, the complexity of the relationships. So when we talk about inequity, and the way it impacts on health. The determinants are complicated, they're interrelated, they're very challenging, and that makes the issue of trying to modify policy in this space even more difficult. It's not linear, it's interrelated and complex. And sorry, I just uh, um, Sharon asked me to just say not to tweet this, because it's still under editorial <laughs> review, so I'm not, sorry, Fran. <laughs> and the, the second thing to note is really the blue boxes around the edge, which speak about things like social policy, employment, health policy, um, food and access. So in addressing policy even just in this space, we're in the position of thinking about multi-sectorial, intersectorial changes, different parts of government working together, government working with the private sector. These are all areas which are particularly difficult to bring about policy change in. It's easier if you're dealing with one health department than if you're dealing with a cross-government, cross-jurisdiction kind of changes. So, you know, in, in this room, probably most of the people in this room have worked to influence policy in some ways or other. We work as doing high quality independent research, which is important. We work as advocates, advisors, and increasingly we work with policy agencies doing commissioned work or work in partnership. But I guess that I think we have, over the last while, come to ask the question, 
can we find ways to have a greater impact on policy? And this, I think, is particularly important in relation to equity because we have already seen that this is going to be a challenging and difficult area to address. So it's mindful, to, we should be mindful of the, those challenges and how we are working in that space. So could give lots of examples of where we've missed opportunities to have an impact, but I like this quote by uh, Pat Anderson because it just says so clearly, we've had lots of research in, in Indigenous health, but how effective has that research been really in changing health service um, and delivery and in policy? So we, we know this is going to be hard and we know that uh, we've got a little way to go in this space to, to be optimally effective. So you know, I, can't, I, th I think that um, th this has there's been a, there's a kind of evolving field really about how we have a greater impact on policy. So I've put a few of the things on the slide here, but many people in this room would know the work of Jonathan Lomas, who probably started this kind of work maybe 20 odd years ago. The fantastic stuff that Sally Davies has done in the UK through the National Institutes for Health Research, and lots of other people who've been developing different kinds of mechanisms for trying to increase the impact of research on policy. And I, you know, kind of, um, where's Anne? I'd like to acknowledge the work of NHMRC here because obviously funding vehicles are really important in space as well as all of the other things. So it, this is a busy field and it's an emerging field. Uh, t I think that we're really at a point of having some promising leads but not really a solid evidence base to indicate that any of these kinds of things actually work in practice. And remember here that most of these things are addressing the way that bureaucrats and policy makers work, they're, they're talking about the way researchers work, not really so much the way that um, um, our big P politicians are, are operating. So I guess um, w w I, I think that um, what I wanted to do next was really to give a couple of examples of these from our, from our own work to illustrate the kinds of things that people are thinking about. N they're not meant to be, um, uh, they're illustrations rather than particularly uh, recommendations about what we should do but I think that we're on a journey here and actually what we need to do is to recognize the fact that as researchers if we're really going to have a better impact on policy we just we're going to need to work in some radically different ways and I think likewise we're also going to need some changes in the way that policy organizations work so two examples so first, um, one of the things that's been exercising us is whether there's better ways to synthesise research so that it informs policy. So typically what we do as researchers is we do a review. So a review is a very passive kind of tool for helping policy agencies engage with research. You know, we would all know as researchers that very often the end point of the review is, well, we need to do more research or there's not enough research here to fully answer this. And really often we're testing we're looking at the research around one particular intervention, one particular question. When we know that in a policy context, there are multiple policies and multiple changes in the environment being implemented at once. So we've been interested in dynamic simulation modelling. I need to acknowledge my colleague Joanne Atkinson at the Sachs Institute, who's led this through the work of the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre. And I guess you know simulation modelling is pretty commonly used for lots of things, including weather forecasting. But we've been interested to see whether we can use it to develop a what-if tool to enable policymakers to explore what's known about the impact of different combinations of interventions and policies. And the other thing that we like about this is, is that we found that we can use this tool as a highly interactive way of building consensus. So one of the challenges for policymakers is that there's often a divergence of views and certainly one of the things that I hear is, is that I go in one day and say one thing and then Louise Bauer goes in another day and says something different and so and a clinician comes in another day. So in essence this is a, a potentially also a tool for building consensus. So the way that we've been running this is as, as follows. So the first model that we built was in relation to alcohol and the Ministry of Health in New South Wales was the sponsor of this and they were interested in seeing what they could do to reduce alcohol hospitalisations associated with um, but, mm, excuse me, both binge drinking and, uh, and chronic alcohol use. So we assembled a group of policy makers, health service providers, clinicians, researchers, uh, consumers and together we developed a group, we undertook a group model building exercise and we built a complicated model of what drives what and thinking about the, the determinants of inappropriate alcohol use and, uh, and, uh, and its impact. 
We then peopled this model, if you like, using different kinds of data. So Stephen alluded to this earlier, I think. So some of those data came from published data, some from, I think, you, what did you call it, community data like ABS or local data. And we also incorporated where we needed to the views of experts. So in all, ordinarily in the policy making process, the views of experts are they're, they're loud, but you can't see how they operate. In this kind of model, you can see where they fit into the, into the process, and there, the comments from that kind of data are also transparent. The policy makers um, that worked on this really liked the process. They said to us that they thought that it was a glass model, rather a glass box rather than a black box, because they could see the assumptions that were built into it. And this particular um, model was an agent-based model. Uh, now, okay, so I hope you can read this, but essentially what's really unique about this process, I think, is that there's a series of drop-down menus that enable a policymaker to be able to think about what kinds of interventions they might be interested in testing and to feed those interventions into the model. They can feed them in at different start points, different end points, different target groups, different doses, different intensities. And what this, in effect, does is enables a series of simulations in which the policymaker plays with the model, if you like, based on the best available evidence to think about how that might impact on the, um, the outcomes that they're interested in. Yeah, so you end up with, a, uh, with an output that looks a little bit like this, so that you can see the impact of your different interventions against what would happen if you didn't intervene. So again, um, yeah, again, I'm not saying that this, I'm saying this is trying to use this as an example of a different kind of more interactive approach to synthesis. So the second example I wanted to give is about strengthening the engagement of policy agencies with research. So, you know, one thing that I often hear from researchers is that they speak to policy agencies and they don't feel that the work that they're presenting is well understood and neither do they feel that there are the skills in that agency to really understand what they're dealing with and to make use of it. So we're not talking here about individuals. Like we, you know, in this room there's lots of people who've been in policy or are in policy and who are, you know, fantastically sophisticated in using data, but what we want to do really is to have a more um, organisational and more systematic approach to using research evidence within the organisation. So it's not dependent on having a particular individual in place at a particular time. So um, we were, whoops, let's see some slide here. So we received a, um, um, an NHMRC uh, CRE grant, um, and so I would just like to acknowledge some of my co-investigators on this, including Louisa Jorm, uh, Anthony Shakeshaft, Kate Dest, um, and Anna Williamson. And through this, we were able to run a multifaceted intervention to see whether or not we could increase the capacity of policy agencies to engage with and use research. So this is the first time that we know of that anybody has been able to undertake a trial of this kind internationally. We were able to persuade six agencies to participate in what was a really long, long step wedge trial that went over two and a half years and I think the fact that they were willing to be engaged in that kind of trial for that period of time was actually um, a testament to um, the interest in policy agencies in doing this kind of work and doing it well. We had to develop some special outcome measures for this and we validated these. So for the social scientists in the room, this is a, we had a fairly eclectic approach to the intervention, but essentially we, we measured how policy agencies use research at the moment. We fed that back to them and we used that information to try and, and help them develop goals about how they wanted to improve their performance in the space. We then ran a series of things around increasing the value they placed on research, providing tools and systems and increasing their knowledge and skills. And somewhat to our surprise, we found that this intervention was effective in increasing a number of things, their tools and systems, their confidence in using research and some aspects of research use. So this is pretty early evidence here, but again, it illustrates the kinds of different ways of working that I think are going to be important if we're really going to address the, um, the, um, the, the better use of research and policy. There's sort of a quote at the bottom from the CEO of one of the participating organisations, and uh, that really captured, I think, the kind of feedback that we got. They felt that this kind of intensive opportunity to think about the extent to which their culture was one which really aligned with using research really made a difference to how they would use research into the future. 
So look, I, I just, um, I hope that these examples are interesting. They're a sort of demonstration of what I think is going to be quite a long journey. I feel like over the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years, we're going to have to really revolutionise a little bit the way that we work as researchers and to work with our policy partners in trying to ensure that their practice is much more aligned to the kind of things that emerge from research. Thank you. We've got time for one or two questions, I think. Sally's kept her instructions really, really well. So, um, is there any questions from the floor? Tony? I just, I just want to reflect on the simulation modelling mm. and how it's transferred that tobacco model, like briefly. Mm. It's, it's taken a lot of work. We've now put for about 10, 15 interventions through that. Mm. The people in the Ministry of Health found it extremely mm. useful and has informed cabinet papers mm. around tobacco tax. And then members of my group just this week were down in Tasmania mm. and it actually ended up being discussed in Parliament that mm. night as to ways to achieve through a smoke free. Because you've got to work hard with the policy makers, you've got to sit down with them and show them how it works. But you know, yeah. I'll rebrand myself as doing structured quantitative speculation rather than <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just, um, it's a comment, but I would just really agree with that. It's not something that, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you need to have some of those engagement relationships in place. But we've actually done quite a few of these now, and I think that the, the, um, the interest from policy agencies has been high, and in New South Wales it's been used, uh, the data of the simulation was used in rethinking the alcohol policy, and we've also done a commission piece for the Premier's um, Council on um, Childhood Obesity. So it's interesting because it starts to suggest different ways of, uh, more engaged way of synthesising research findings. Okay, thanks, Sally.